There Will Be Wolves by Carlene Bradford, Chapter 7 The shock of seeing Bruno was so great that for a moment Ursula couldn't find her voice. Finally, she managed to speak. Bruno, what are you doing here? How... It seems I couldn't let you go off on your own after all, he answered. He rubbed at his forehead slowly. I stood and watched you from the city gate on the morning and left, and I almost ran after you then, but I couldn't go without speaking to my master at the church. I tried very hard all day to convince myself that my place was in Cologne, not on this crusade. I tried the next day as well, but somehow or another, when I went to work that morning, I found myself asking if I could be excused. The work on the church is nearly done, and my master thinks the crusade is a worthwhile and godly venture, so he let me go. I've marched without stopping for more than a few hours of sleep, and here I am. The weight that had bowed Ursula down disappeared. She felt suddenly lightheaded, almost giddy. I am so glad to see you, she cried. Then his first words sank in. But the Jews? What did you say about the Jews of Mainz? Surely you were mistaken. I wish with all my heart that I were, Bruno answered. But I have the information from one who witnessed it all. There are eight to ten Jews left in Mainz at the most. David, Ursula whispered. What about David? Bruno shrugged hopelessly. There's no way of knowing. Those who escaped are being well hidden. No one will speak of them. Samson trotted over at that moment. Bruno reached down to pat him, the look on, the look of pain on his face deepening. At the sight of the dog, Ursula's eyes filled with tears. She knelt quickly and buried her face in his scraggly fur, the weight and the worry returning, but the touch of Bruno's hand on her shoulder brought a measure of comfort. Thank God that he has come, she thought. With Bruno here now, perhaps this can be born. Finally, the crusaders reached the point where they had to cross the Rhine and leave the Rhine Valley. From here, they would make their way up the River Nectar until they reached the waters of the almost legendary River Donby. The Donby would lead them the, gentle, the gentlest way around the mountains that stood between them and the Byzantine Empire. Mountains so high, it was said, that snow stayed on them all summer long. At the crossing point, they camped on a wide plain. The people filled it as far as Ursula could see. A fleet of small wooden boats bobbed in the river current just offshore. She looked at them dubiously. Surely we are not meant to make such a dangerous crossing in those tiny craft, she said. They say they will bring larger ferries for the wagons and horses, Bruno answered, but he, too, looked worried. They began early the next morning but it was obvious it would take days to ferry them all across. The current had abated a bit, but the crossings each took almost an hour and looked to be filled with danger. Just how dangerous they actually were was suddenly brought home to those watching on the shore. For some reason, the oarsmen on one ferry faltered when they reached the middle, in the fastest and most treacherous part of the current. A shout went up from the boatman, but it was too late. In the instant, the oarsmen faltered. The current caught the boat and swung it broadside. Within seconds, it was broached, swamped, and overturned. Before Ursula's horrified eyes, men, horses, and the boat itself were all carried out of sight around a bend. Go in one of the small boats with your father, Bruno urged when it was their turn. They're safer. I'll go with the horse and the wagon and the ferry. No, Ursula answered stubbornly. Afraid though she was, she would not leave it up to Bruno to care for their belongings. I'll stay with the wagon. Master William would not be separated from them either, so together they braced themselves against the lurching seat of the wagon as Bruno guided it onto the ferry. Ursula fought down panic. She had never been off the land before, and the river that had seemed wide, even from the safety of the shore, was now unbelievably frightening. What she hadn't expected was the noise. The current hissed and sucked and slapped at the boat like a living thing. The oarsmen sweated with the strain of fighting their way across while the ferry rocked and lurched insanely. Water spewed over the low sides in a drenching spray. It seemed an eternity before they were safely on the other side. As the horse and wagon lumbered off the ferry, Ursula leaped down onto the ground. Never before had she appreciated just how good it was to have firm earth beneath her feet. Samson seemed to feel the same way. He too jumped off at the first possible moment. Then, pointing his nose to the sky, he gave a couple happy barks at nothing at all, just for the sheer joy of being a dog.
back on land again. The hills along the nectar sloped more gradually, and the forests were less deep. The land opened out a bit on either side of the river. The going was less rough. Ursula's father's spirits brightened perceptibly as they traveled on. The Count had recovered from his indisposition, and Master Billiam had been able to get his rest at night. "'Look at what marvelous distances we are marching each day, daughter,' he declared. "'We're getting closer and closer to Jerusalem all the time.' But Ursula could not share his enthusiasm. Each day, the people on foot dragged farther and farther behind. She could not get the memory out of her mind of what they looked like, straggling into the camp hours after the wagons had arrived. The night before, she had been stirring their evening stew when a woman, carrying a baby and then leading another child by the hand, shambled past their campsite. There seemed to be no man with them. The woman had stared at their well-provisioned wagon and their fire burning brightly against the night airs, and a look almost of hate had crossed her face. Ursula had been stricken. At first, all she had been able to do was stare back. By the time she had collected herself enough to think of offering to share their food, the woman and her children had disappeared into the darkness. Ursula couldn't get David out of her mind either. They had not been able to get any further news about him or, or his family, and now they were far past Maine's. It seemed likely that she would never know. One night, just after they, they had made camp and Bruno had gone to collect firewood, he returned, breathless. Peter is to speak. Hurry! We should go to hear him. Ursula jumped up and helped her father to struggle to his feet beside her. Peter had not spoken to them at all since they had left. They hurried to the nobles' end of the campsite, along with most of the others, hanging on tightly to each other so as to not get separated in the crush. The hermit's eyes burned with fervor. His voice rang out over the crowd, echoing Ursula's father's words as he rejoiced with them over the distance they had already traveled. He was even thinner than before. His amanicated frame looked as if it was being consumed from within by the same fire that flamed from his eyes. "'We will triumph!' he cried. "'Our her holy crusade will set Jerusalem free for all time. The infidels will fall before our might, like moths before a flame. God wills it!' The nobles and the soldiers who flanked him drew their swords. For a moment, the sound of iron being drawn drowned out everything else. Then they raised their weapons high in the torchlight, and their voices roared to join with the hermits. God wills it, they cried. God wills it. Ursula stole a sideways glance at Bruno. His face was as grim as it had been the very first morning he had heard the hermit, hermit preach. She felt a shiver of apprehension crawled on her spine. The mob that day had been frightening, but, for the most part, unarmed. The murder had still been done. The spectacle that presented itself in the flickering glow of flames this night was much more frightening. She remembered how Bruno had argued against this crusade then, and now here he was, because of her. The majority of the people took the speech as a signal to celebrate. Barrels of ale were broached, wineskins were passed around freely, by midnight, most of the soldiers and a goodly part of the common people were drunk. Ursula sat at the open flap of their tent, holding herself away from the commotion. The Count had been sent for Master William after the kerosene had begun to die down, and he had gone with his bags of herbs and medicines. Bruno had disappeared without a word. What if he doesn't come back? The thought worried and teased at her. What if he has realized that he wants no part of this after all, and he's returned to Cologne? One part of her mind knew he would not go without telling her, the other imagined the worst. When he finally did return and started to make up his bed under the wagon, she could not resist a sharp comment. I thought perhaps you had left us, she said. Bruno looked up at her over the dying fire, surprised. You know I would do no such thing, he answered. You didn't want to come. The way the crusaders are behaving tonight. I like it not. That is true. I'm afraid of what is to come. I did not ask you to join us. It was your own decision, Ursula burst out. She listened to her own words with horror, but she was powerless to stop them. It's not my fault that you were here. Of course not. I have never said so, Bruno straightened up. 
"'What ails you, Ursula?' "'Nothing,' she answered shortly, and retreated into the tent, pulling the flap shut behind her. "'It's not my fault,' she repeated to herself. Nevertheless, she felt guilty. It was not a comfortable feeling. "'Father, our supplies are dwindling,' Ursula announced as Master William emerged from the tent early the next morning. In the cold light of dawn, his face looked pale and tired. The previous day's enthusiasm evaporated away. The Count had kept him very late the night before. "'Child, we are well provided for,' her father answered distractedly. "'The wagon burst at its seams.' "'True,' Ursula agreed. "'But we are using things up more quickly than I had expected. "'Without the chickens, we have no eggs, and there are weevils in the flour. "'Have you spoken to the Count again about that bag of silver he promised us? "'I would feel easier if we had it.' "'The Count has promised to take care of us,' her father said. His manner was evasive. He will see to our wants. But, Father, he has promised. We should hold him to his word. He is so devious, I trust him not. This is not your concern, daughter, her father answered shortly. The Count and I have come to our agreements. There is no need for you to worry. But Ursula's words were cut off as he turned irritably away from her. I have a few coins, Bruno said from behind her as Master William walked away. My master paid me before I left. You had better save those for yourself, seeing as you are so worried about how things are going to turn out, Ursula replied. Again, she regretted her harsh words the instant they were out of her mouth, but she had never accepted alms from anyone in her life, and she had no intention of beginning now. Bruno turned away without answering. They got off to a slow start that day. More than half the company appeared to be suffering greatly from the effects of the night before. Pale, sweating men, cursed wagons, and beasts. Accidents were more numerous than ever, and fights broke out in every quarter. It was almost noon before their wagon could move. They passed through numerous villages on their way up the nectar. Word of their coming had obviously gone ahead of them, and in every little town the people flocked out to see them, to wish them well, and even to press food and provisions on them. "'God speed you!' one woman called out to Ursula as their wagon passed by. To Ursula's amazement, she was holding out a live chicken in offering. For a moment, Ursula was tempted. Then her pride reasserted itself. "'Thank you, mistress, but we have no need of that.' "'Weren't you worrying about supplies?' her father observed. "'That chicken would have come in very handy.' "'We have no need of charity, father,' Ursula answered stiffly. "'There are those who are in far greater want.' Her father sighed and watched regret regretfully as the woman in the wagon behind them accepted the chicken greedily. The valley began to narrow and steepen. The nectar was not nearly as big a river as the Rhine and the hills on either side were nowhere near as high, but the land now rose sharply on both sides of the river. The crusaders found themselves strung out in a, in a long, narrow file. It was difficult in these circumstances to find a place large and wide enough for them to camp. At one village, however, the land flattened out to, to some extent into the fields that the villagers had cultivated. The hermit stopped there. As Bruno and Ursula set up the tent and made the evening fire, the townspeople, curious about the crusade and anxious to hear more about it, began to filter into the camp. Many of them brought gifts of food. "'Good evening, mistress,' a voice said hesitantly from the darkness at the edge of the firelight. Ursula looked up to see a young boy staring at her shyly. For a moment he reminded her of David. She caught her breath. Then she saw he was holding out a handful of small, wizened turnips we have not much mistress but what we have we would share with you who are on such a holy crusade he said an automatic refusal came to her lips but died as she looked into the boy's eyes thank you she said reaching out for the offering we thank you very much the boy beamed go with god he said and turned to scamper away Ursula looked up to see Bruno smiling for the first time in a long while. The true spirit of God does show itself in unexpected places, doesn't it, he said. Unsure of what he meant, 
Ursula turned quickly away to add the tur turnips to their stores. That evening, just as they were finishing their meal, the sound of music drifted over to them from a circle of people gathered around a large fire in the middle of the camp. Ursula was immediately interested, Bruno as well. They had not heard music since they had left Cologne. Shall we go over and see what is happening? Bruno asked. Yes, let us, Ursula answered, surprised at the lightning and excitement in her heart. Will you come too, father? No, child, the old man answered. I will rest and listen from here. Ursula looked at him, worried for a moment. He seemed very tired and frail, but Bruno reached out a hand and pulled her to her feet. As they reached the fire, they saw four people standing near it. There were three young men and a woman. The men were dressed in brightly colored tunics and hoods. The woman wore a soft woolen shift of deep blue. In the flickering firelight, it set off her pale golden hair perfectly. Each was playing an instrument. One man, who seemed to be the leader of the group, was playing a long, narrow lute. Another blew into an ocarina. The third man had a strange instrument that Ursula had never seen before. It consisted of a skin pouch which he tucked under his arm, attached to a pipe into which he blew. The music thus produced was wild and haunting, almost overpowering all the rest. The woman was beating time on a little drum hanging from her neck and decorated with many colored ribbons. She was singing and her clear voice carried easily to where Ursula and Bruno stood. As they watched and listened, Ursula became aware that the woman was not as old as she had supposed. In fact, she looked to be only a few years older than Ursula herself, no more than a girl yet. Suddenly, Ursula was surprised to see a small face peek out from behind her skirts. The men joined in the singing. Ursula did not understand the words. They were in a dialect she had never heard before. But the tunes were at once lively and haunting, and the voices exceptionally good. The woman's voice, in particular, was pure and true. They sang and played for around an hour. Ursula sat beside Bruno on the grass, eyes closed, carried away from herself with the sweet music. She could almost believe she was back in Cologne, listening to a group of strolling minstrels in their own marketplace. When they finally stopped, she opened her eyes with a sigh of regret back to reality into a field that was getting cold and damp. The minstrels bowed low. Then the woman reached behind her and pulled forth a tiny girl. The child's fine hair hung down far below her narrow shoulders, paler even than the woman's, nearly white in the firelight. The woman whispered something in her ear and pushed her forward. Reluctantly, the child moved. She came hesitantly toward the group of people, holding out a tattered velvet pouch. Some people laughed and tousled her hair as they dropped a coin into her bag. She came toward Ursula. I have nothing for her, Ursula whispered. I have a small coin, Bruno answered. The child approached them. Her eyes were wide, and she had the air of a wild fawn that if startled might bolt. She shrank back from them a bit as she held out the pouch, obviously expecting another caress and not wishing it. Here you are, my little mistress, Bruno said with utmost gallantry. He dropped his coin into the pouch and made a bow, careful not to touch her. Her face lit up with a radiant smile, but Ursula frowned. Now that the child was up close, she could see an, an enormous bruise purpling one cheek, and the thin arm that held her pouch was scarred by an angry red welt. The child must have had a bad fall. Ursula's fingers itched to soothe that swelling with a cooling poultice, but just at that moment their leader barked in order. The child's smile disappeared instantly, and she ran back to the woman to hide again behind her skirts. The minstrels bowed their thanks and melted into the shadows. The next day, as they were riding out of the camp, Ursula looked back. The fields where they had stayed were flattened. Crops were overrun and destroyed. As far as she could see, the ruined ground looked as if a plague of locusts had passed through. Not a blade or leaf of anything green remained to be seen. Everything had been either taken or trampled into the mud. Litter, refuse, and filth were strewn everywhere. Not a very kind way to repay the villagers' generosity, she thought. 